Hello again. I recently bought a digital oscilloscope with a view to finding out what's wrong with the video output on an old Commodore computer I have. But before I did that, I thought I'd try it out on my BBC Micro, which has a good, clean, working display, so I could get familiar with it. OK, standard disclaimer time. In case it's not immediately obvious over the next few minutes, I'm not an electronics expert. In fact, I'd never touched an oscilloscope until a couple of days ago. Someone's bound to comment and tell me that I'm doing something wrong, or maybe even horribly dangerous. So if you go poking around inside your computer and manage to blow it up, you did so at your own risk, and I'm not to blame. The BBC Master has the same video outputs as a regular BBC Micro, an RCA socket for the now almost useless UHF PAL TV signal, a monochrome video signal on a BNC connector, and an RGB monitor output through this 6-pin DIN connector. We're going to look at the RGB output first, and then at the monochrome video output later. The RGB output was for a TTL level monitor of the time, but it can be fed into a SCART connector for use on an analog TV with an RGB input, or via one of these SCART to HDMI converters, and gives a very good picture for a 40 year old computer. The only complication is the TTL voltage level needs to be brought down with some resistors, which can be hidden in the SCART plug. When I first started this project, I used the oscilloscope probes directly on the terminals on the back of the DIM plug, but that was a bit awkward and messy. Since then, however, I found this short breakout cable on eBay. It's meant for use with the Sony Broadcast Video Monitor, but it works well for what I'm doing here. It has an RGB SCART socket on one end and a series of RCA plugs on the other, some with BNC adapters on the end. The red, green and blue plugs are for those signals. The yellow is for the composite sync, and the other red and white plugs are for the audio, which aren't connected on the BBC cable. I've connected the SCART plug on the end of the cable from my BBC into this old 5-way SCART switch, so I can split the output between the HDMI converter, attached to a monitor, and also connect the breakout cable. OK, I've uh, stashed the SCART switch box out of the way underneath my desk. I should say that I know that the video signal, being analogue, will suffer some sort of degradation passing through the switch box, the extra cable length, the switching mechanism itself, the fact that the signal is being split, and indeed I can see that the picture on my monitor is not quite as good as it was when it was directly connected. Um, however, today we're really just looking at the qualitative aspects of the signal and not the details of any noise or signal attenuation. OK, so let's connect things up to the oscilloscope. I have a Regal DS1054Z, which is a very popular entry-level digital oscilloscope. It has four channels, which means it can accept four separate input signals simultaneously. I believe that attaching a cable directly to the oscilloscope, rather than using a probe, will cause problems, and you're supposed to use a terminating resistor to avoid signal reflection, causing the constructive and destructive interference. This is mainly an issue at higher frequencies than we're using here, but I might as well at least try to appear what I know what I'm doing. Normally you seem to use 50 ohm terminators with oscilloscopes, but video electronics usually use 75 ohm resistors, so I'm using those. I've tried both and the effect is much the same. You can attach the terminator to the end of the cable with one of these T-pieces and a resistor, which takes me back to the days of 10 base 2 Ethernet. You can then attach the whole thing to the channel input terminal. We can now attach the remaining inputs. The red to channel 2, the green to 3, the blue to 4, and with the yellow sync signal on channel 1. Before we go any further, we'll do a few housekeeping setup tasks. The first is to adjust the probe multiplier from 10 times to 1 times. Regular oscilloscope probes have a 10 times attenuation for voltage, and this just tells the oscilloscope to scale the measured value. The number in the bottom left corner of the screen is the volts per horizontal division, and you can see it change. As we're not using any probes and there's no attenuation, we just set it to 1 times. The next thing to do is turn on AC coupling. This filters out the low frequency DC voltage level and just shows the higher frequency AC components. Effectively, it just removes the base voltage level of the signal. And the final thing to do is the oscilloscope has the ability to add a text label to channels on the screen, so I'll set it to channel 1 to say that it's the sync. We can now turn on all the other channels and do exactly the same things to those. To see all the signals separately, we can use the position and scale controls to adjust the vertical position and size of each channel's trace on the screen. It is, however, much easier just to push the auto button. This detects which channels are connected, measures the voltage levels on each, and arranges them neatly on the screen from top to bottom. There's a lot of clicking of relays inside whilst it works out what's going on. 
If you ever get in a muddle with a digital oscilloscope, pushing this button is an easy way of resetting a lot of the controls and getting back to something on the screen again. Okay, so we've got our four signals showing up on the oscilloscope, but they're sort of flickering around all over the place and we can't see any details or anything of what's going on. So what an oscilloscope does is it graphs voltage changes over time. So without any help, it's just going to show this constantly changing voltage level. What we want to do is we want to lock on to a particular point of the signal and we want to hold that in a constant place on the screen so we can see how the signal changes around that. And we do that with something called a trigger. By default, the trigger is set to edge mode, which locks onto the rising edge of the signal on channel 1, where it passes from a low to high voltage through a threshold value. If I zoom in horizontally, showing a shorter time period, I can then adjust the threshold with the trigger value knob and get it mostly locked onto the sink, but it's still flickering a bit and the red, green and blue channels are still flashing a lot. OK, so an edge trigger is fine for something simple like a square wave or a sine wave, but it isn't very useful for something like a video signal. There's a uh, pulse between each scan line on the display. There's also a pile of them at the bottom of the display to indicate that the video beam should return to the start. So this is why we're getting a flickering image on the oscilloscope, because sometimes it's locking onto one of those pulses between the scan lines, and sometimes it's locking onto one of the pulses at the end of the display. So you've got all of the uh, video information sort of constantly flickering like this. OK, so the scope helps us out here. It can actually understand the patterns of various different types of signal, including analog video and trigger on specific parts of this. To do this, we bring up the trigger menu. Then we pick the type of trigger we want, which is video. We then need to set the video standard, which is PAL. And then, finally, I'll tell it to synchronise onto a particular line of the display. The line option is now highlighted, and we can adjust this using the knob at the top here. I'll spin it down until we see some signals on the RGB channels, around line 35, and zoom out a bit so we can see a few adjacent lines. So what we're looking at here is the signal for a particular row of pixels on the screen. The trace here is caused by a slice through the text. The levels of red, green and blue are equal because the text on the screen is white. By moving the cursor up on the screen, we can actually see the text on the boot screen actually starts on the second line of the display. If we enter this command, we can clear the screen and immediately change the colours on the first line to be white text on a red background. And we can now move up the lines on the screen using the oscilloscope and find that the teletext mode starts on line 22. The little orange marker with the T in it at the top of the screen shows the exact trigger point at the beginning of the line. Now since the bar is red, we only get a signal on that channel for it. If I now type some white X's, you can see them starting to appear on the following line, as there's a single line gap between the start of the bar and the start of the text. We get a signal on all the channels because the text is white. If I move down the lines, we can see that the red bar ends on line 31. The flashing blip is actually the cursor, which is displayed in the inverse colour to the background. We can also work out that teletext mode has text lines which are 10 scan lines high. To better see all the colours and how they are shown as RGB signals, I've written a little test card program to display bars of each colour in mode 2, the low resolution multicolour graphics mode. The bars here are shown in the order they're numbered on the BBC. It only has 8 colours, the result of all the combinations of having either nothing or all of a particular RGB component. There are no partial intensities to create something like an orange or a grey. For example, the blue bar is just a maximum blue, the red bar is just full red, and the purple bar is the maximum red and blue. They're a bit stark compared to some of the softer colours on things like the Commodore 64 and others, especially on this RGB signal. The numbers at the top of the bars are the BBC colour numbers. At the bottom I've written the name of the colour and show whether a particular colour has the red, green or blue components in it. Moving back to the oscilloscope, it's lost sync again. The reason for this is the BBC has the ability to output the graphics modes in progressive scan mode. This is the default on the BBC Master, so I have to change the video trigger to 576p to get it to synchronise again. I can now adjust the horizontal scale and position to zoom in on one entire scan line so we can see the signal better. So we're still on line 35 from before, which is two lines below the top of the display in graphics mode. What we're looking at here is the signal across a line of the display up at the top here. You can see the red channel alternates between off and on as we pass across the columns. The green channel is off for two columns, on for two, and then off and on for two again. The blue channel is only on for the last four columns. 
There's also this little glitch at the start of the line in the black bar. What's this? Well, it's a row of pixels in the prompt character. We can center it and zoom right in and have a look. If we move down through the lines one by one, we can see the pixels in the prompt move from left to right and then back again following the shape of the greater than sign, and because it's white it shows on all channels. Finally we get to this flashing line. That's the cursor. If I type a comma you can see the dot on the last row of that appear steady and the cursor moves across one character space, overlapping the edge of the red bar, inverting it. Zooming out and recentering on the trigger again, we can see the horizontal sync pulse. It occurs between each scan line, and it's high for most of the time, but dips low between each line. If I move up the lines into the black overscan area and towards the top of the display, you can see the vertical sync pulse appear. The sync signal is a composite of the horizontal and vertical sync pulses, and is exclusive or of both, so the signal is inverted for a couple of lines between each frame. OK, something else. If I connect a cable to the composite output on the back of the BBC, I'll get a monochrome video signal. And I can now attach this to channel 1 on the oscilloscope, replacing the sync from the RGB connector. OK, so first I'm going to change the coupling back to DC, and then switch off the label as it appears in the wrong place on the screen. And I'll now adjust the vertical position to get the trace back onto the screen. AC coupling on this signal causes the base voltage to move up and down, depending on the brightness of the signal, and lose sync. I only really used AC coupling before to get the labels to line up with the signals and help show what was going on. Finally, I'll adjust the trigger level to find the sync pulse in the signal, which is at a slightly lower voltage than the rest of it. We can now see the monochrome signal above the red, green and blue. The steps show the relative brightness of the colour bars plus the sync pulses, which is why it's called a composite signal, as it combines the video with the sync. The eye doesn't see the red, green and blue as the same intensities. Green appears the brightest, red the second, and blue last. You can see this as the bars which include a green component are the highest on the monochrome level. Right, let's dig out this lovely old green screen monitor and connect the mono video input on the back to the composite signal from the T-piece, replacing the 75 ohm terminator. We can now see the monochrome output on the green screen monitor and that the intensity of the bars corresponds to the level of the composite signal. Right, now I can edit the program to change line 60, which chooses the colour that's used for a particular bar. So instead of using the bar number as the BBC colour, it calls this function Luma to colour. I've defined on lines 290 and 300 a function to change the brightness value from 0 to 7 into a BBC colour number by swapping the bits around to make green the most significant, red next, and blue least. And if I run the program again, the bars are now displayed in ascending order of brightness, and this is reflected in the voltage level on the composite signal and in the image on the green screen monitor. OK, one last thing. I mentioned earlier the BBC can output a progressive scan image, or at least interlace off, as described in the manual. I was pretty intrigued about that because it seemed pretty advanced for 1981. Mode 7, Teletext, is only ever output in interlaced mode, but graphics modes 0-6 can be output in either interlaced or non-interlaced formats. The new advanced user guide illustrates this, showing the two modes as either normal sync and interlace sync. This is actually just displaying only ever one field of the interlaced display, never the other. This gives a display that doesn't shake up and down, but does leave a little gap between each line of the display, because only the odd or even lines are being shown. To see this, I've written a short basic program to toggle between the two modes. The star TV commands on lines 50 and 110 change the output mode. The second parameter is 0 for interlaced, or 1 for non-interlaced. You can't see the difference on an LCD display as the SCART to HDMI converter removes the flicker, but the green screen CRT visibly shakes in interlaced mode. The black lines between each scan line are blurred out in interlace mode too, but you can clearly see them in the non-interlace mode. I think that the text isn't flickering offsets the minor problem of the black lines, which often get blurred out anyway when the contrast is increased, as I've got it fairly low here to help you see them. I had real trouble shooting all this as all my decent cameras removed the flicker on the recordings. I had to resort to a cheap action cam and slow the replay down to half just to capture it. OK, moving back to the oscilloscope, as that's what we're here for today. I've disconnected the cable to the green screen monitor to get at the controls more easily. And I've also turned off the red, green and blue channels, as we're only really interested in the sync here. Starting with the non-interlaced mode, let's have a look at the vertical sync up at the start of the display. 
and adjust the horizontal controls to get a good view of it. Now the oscilloscope can save a current trace as a reference waveform. I'm going to save this signal as reference waveform 1 and then I'll move it down below the input signal and change the colour to green so we can tell the difference easily. Now we'll switch to interlace mode and look at the same sync. It's actually easy to see this down at the end of the display, so we'll spin down to near line 625 at the bottom of a PAL screen. Once we get there we can fine tune the horizontal position to compare the two sinks, and we can see that they're exactly the same, so there's nothing different about them. OK, now let's move to the middle of the display, about line 315. An interlaced PAL signal has 625 lines, composed of two fields of 312 and 313 lines. There's a sync signal in between them to reset it back to the top. Adjusting the controls to get it on the screen nicely, we can compare it to the reference signal for the vertical sync and see that it's different. Let's save this as reference waveform 2 and position it at the bottom, and then change the colour. OK, switching back to non-interlace mode, we can see that there's also a sync in the same place, around halfway through the 625 lines. Comparing this with the two save waveforms, we can see that it's the same as the vertical sync at the top of the screen. So really, non-interlace mode is just transmitting the same one half of the interlace display over and over again, and not a progressive scan mode at all, where all 625 lines would be sent one after another. So I hope that's been interesting and maybe explained a few things. Uh, just before I go, I'll mention that uh, recently I got hold of two other devices for converting an uh, analog signal from an old computer into an HDMI digital signal. Uh, one of them is John Cortink's BBC to DVI converter, and the other one is the RGB to HDMI project, which takes a Raspberry Pi Zero with a special header board on it um, and converts it with some special software. Now, both of these devices produce excellent results and give you a, a much better picture than one of the uh, traditional sort of SCART to HDMI converters, and maybe I'll review these in a later video. But that's all for now. I hope it's been interesting and see you next time.